morning. Welcome to Australian Reading Hour with HarperCollins. We're so excited that you've decided to take an hour out of your day with us to read from The Muddle-Headed Wombat by Ruth Park and illustrated by Norella Young. We hope you sit down and get comfortable with your cup of tea and we'll read to you for the next hour. So chapter one, let's meet Wombat. There was once a muddle-headed wombat sitting in the grass and feeling very lonely. A wombat is a square animal with thick hair like a doormat, stumpy legs and no tail to speak of. He has brown eyes and a comfortable leathery flat nose like a koala. This wombat was lonely because he had no sisters or brothers or aunties or uncles and besides, he had spent all his pocket money. I wish I had a friend, he thought, a nice comfy little friend who would fit in my cardigan pocket. A wombat could have lots of adventures with a friend like that. Suddenly, in the paddock nearby, he saw a wooden man waving his wooden arms and squeaking a song of his own. Squeak, 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 squawk. He was a scarecrow. He wore a raggy old coat and a big hat and yellow gloves on his wooden hands. Wombat was pleased to see him. Perhaps I could make friends with him. You hear, Mr. Scarecrow, here comes your little wombat. Every time the wind puffed over the gullies, the wooden man swung his arms to left and right. Wombat thought the scarecrow was waving to him. He stood up on his hind legs and pulled at the scarecrow's coat. Here I am, are you pleased I'm here? Thump, down came the scarecrow's wooden hand on Wombat's head. Wombat was very cross. He didn't understand that it was the wind's fault. That's a horrible thing to a new friend, he growled. You're a hideous old polywoggle. I'm going to push you over, that's what I'm going to do. And he put his forehead against the post which held the scarecrow in its place and he pushed and pushed until there was a creak and a crack, and down went the wooden man, all in a heap. Away bowled his straw hat, with Wombat trembling after it. It was such a friendly looking hat, with a raggy brim, and a great many windows in the crown, that Wombat put it on. Anyway, you and I can be friends, you dear old hat, he said. All at once, Wombat heard a queer noise. It was like a fairy sobbing. Wombat was excited. Do you hear that, you dear old hat? That's a very little animal being sad and miserable. He hurried over to the edge of the road and peered in amongst the tall grass stalks. He was the tiniest, furriest animal rolled in a ball and crying to itself. Wombat had a soft heart. He couldn't bear the sight. A tear ran down his nose and plopped onto the stranger's little head. At once it unrolled itself, sat up and said angrily, and now it's raining on this awful day for me. Wombat liked the little animal's pink, piggy nose and soft grey fur. He liked the way it carried its long tail over its arm as though it were a train of an evening dress. He chuckled. If this is it raining at all, it's me crying. Well, don't cry on me, whoever you are. I've had enough troubles already. As it spoke, the little animal closed up its mouth tight, worried away and began pawing around in the grass. I'm looking for my glasses, it exclaimed. I've dropped them somewhere and I can't find them. Oh, bother, bother, bother. Wombat was happy to help to look for the glasses. He was very good at losing things, so he thought that perhaps he'd be good at finding them too. He scrabbled around in the grass roots, and in a moment he had found the lost spectacles. They were just about as tiny as spectacles can get. In fact, the little animal used a sweet pea pod for carrying them around. Wombat was happy that he'd been so useful. Aren't I a smart wombat, eh? Aren't I? He kept saying. I'll see in a moment, said the little animal. It put on the glasses and looked at Wombat. It started at his toes and worked upwards, and by the time it had reached the top of his head, it had a crick in its neck. You really are dreadfully big, it complained. I can fold up a bit, you watch, said Wombat eagerly, and he pulled in his toes and humped down his neck and flattened up his ears. I'm really terribly small, you know. The little animal took no notice. You don't look very sensible either. I've got lots of brains, said Wombat. You listen to them rattle. He shook his head and it rattled beautifully. My, said the little animal. Wombat was very interested in his new friend. I can see you're a mouse. Are you like the mouse mouses that live in houses? Certainly not. The mouse's nose turned as red as a radish with indignation. I'm a fat-tailed pouch bush mouse and don't you forget it. Wombat didn't have to ask the mouse to come and live with him and share his adventures. The mouse liked Wombat. It liked his stumpy paws and his muddled up whiskers. It decided it might as well live in his big straw hat as anywhere else. The mouse scooted up Wombat's arm and under his hat. The next moment its long pink nose stuck out through a hole in the front. Oh, what a lovely view it is from up here, Wombat. 
That's all very well, Mouse, but it's not my hat, you know. I have to give it back to the old wooden man I pushed over. Wombat trundled back to the paddock to see, see where the old, woman, the old wooden man had got up again. There he was, the silly old fellow, still lying on the ground. Come on, up you get. Don't stop. He tugged at the scarecrow's yellow glove, and all at once the wooden man came to pieces. His straw stuffing fell out. His sugar bag waistcoat came off and his wooden arms clattered to the ground. There was nothing left but his goggly painted face on the end of a broomstick. Wombat's eyes almost popped out. Oh, Mouse, look what your wombat has done. I've killed him dead as dead can be. Now, now, you can't do that to a wooden man, answered the mouse, calmly polishing its glasses with the end of its tail. And besides, the farmer is coming, so you'll be able to explain. The farmer wasn't cross. He said the old scarecrow needed to be pulled down anyway. He didn't mind if Wombat took away the old straw hat. Wombat was happy and Mouse was happy. Mouse was so happy that it decided to give Wombat a little present. I hope it's a banana, said Wombat. No, it's this, said Mouse. And it took out of its pouch something very small and silvery. Wombat put it up close to his eyes. Then he held it away as far as he could. Still, he couldn't make out what it was. Silly, said Little Mouse. It's for music. It's a mouth organ. Wombat lay down on his back and kicked his short legs in the air for joy. He'd never seen anything quite as cute as this tiny, tiny mouth organ. The mouse played a bar or two of music. It was as high and thin as the music that crickets made. Then Mouse said it would teach Wombat to play if he'd stand up and stop kicking. Take a deep breath, Wombat, and make a good big noise. He took a deep breath, and he blew, and the mouth organ gave a beautiful squawk. Then he drew in his breath again, and this time the mouth organ went with it. It vanished altogether inside his mouth. He heard it give a sad little squeak as it arrived somewhere inside him under the last button of his cardigan. Mouse was furious. It wasn't very good mannered of you to swallow my present, Wombat. Wombat hadn't meant to swallow it. What good was it down there? He felt very sad. Then he noticed that every time he breathed, the mouth organ made a musical sound. Do you know what, Mouse? Soon I'll be able to play a tune on my breath. The mouse glared at him. But don't you see, Mouse, if I can play a tune on my breath and sing a song, then people might give us pennies. And Mouse, we could save up and buy a bike. With red wheels, asked the mouse, who'd like to get everything straight. So it was agreed. They found a little town and a street and a corner, and there they stood, blushing and twiddling their paws and trying not to mind when people stared at them. The mouse held Wombat's ankle tightly. It was nervous lest one of those big shoes passing by should tread on it. Wombat knew a tune. It was, My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean. It sounded like this. My Bonnie lies over the ocean. My Bonnie lies over the sea. Oh, please won't you hear my commotion and give lots of pennies to me. Then he took off his hat and trundled around amongst the crowd. He got four pennies and five threepences and one creamy toffee which he liked even more than the threepences. He and Mouse were very happy. They thought they would be able to save up for their bike very quickly. Then along came a policeman. Now then, now then, he said to Wombat, in this town, people are not allowed to play musical instruments in the streets for money. But he wasn't, said Mouse, popping his head out of Wombat's sleeve. I just play on my breath, said Wombat proudly, and he gave a wonderful musical cough for the policeman. The policeman walked right around Wombat, he looked him over carefully. There was no mouth organ to be seen. Perhaps Wombat was telling the truth, but still the policeman had his duty to do. You'd better come along with me and see the sergeant, he said. Wombat was excited. He'd never seen the sergeant. He jumped up and down with joy and poor Mouse fell out of his sleeve. It scrambled back into his hat just in time before the policeman trod on it by mistake. They were taken along to the sergeant's desk at the police station. The mouse sat on the ink bottle and explained what happened. The sergeant said that Wombat couldn't be blamed for playing music in the street when all he had done was to breathe. Meanwhile, Mouse was looking around the police station. Huddled up on a chair in one corner was a grey tabby cat. He was skinny and miserable, and he had a peaky little face with big ears. He wore a bright red bow tie, 
but anyone could see it hadn't been washed and ironed for weeks. Oh my, thought tender-hearted Mouse, that cat is a stray cat. Anyone can see there's no one to love him. Mouse began to wonder if, by any chance, a mouse could keep a pet cat of its own. Chapter 2. Here Comes Teddy. Mouse twigged the sergeant's shoelaces. If no one else wants that cat, he said, may I have it? The sergeant was pleased. He did not really want a police station cat because he had one already. But Wombat felt very jealous and bristly. He made a grumble umble sound deep in his middle. Why do you want a cat when you've got me, Mouse, eh? he asked. Because he's such a skinny, squeaky, plain little cat, explained Mouse. Poor thing. Wombat made the grumble-umble noise again, and this time it got mixed up with the mouth organ, and with one last horrid drone, the mouth organ became silent. See what you've made me do, scolded Wombat. Now I can't play on my breath, and how will we get pennies to buy a bike with red wheels? But Mouse wasn't listening. It had scampered over to the cat and was bouncing up and down and twinkling its spectacles. Would you like to come and live with Wombat and me and be our second best friend and have adventures and save up for a bike with red wheels? The cat nodded. What's your name? asked Mouse. Vernon Lapuss, said the cat in a low trembling voice. Oh, it is not, said Wombat. You're making up stories. I can tell by your drooping whiskers. Haven't you got a sense of bubble name like Mouse or Wombat? The cat wiped away a tear. I just made it up because it sounds so grand. My name's really just Tabby Cat and nobody loves me. Come on then, said Mouse, and Wombat and I will love you. Wombat wasn't a bit sure that he wanted to love Tabby Cat. He knew he didn't want his nice little mouse to love Tabby Cat. He felt very jealous. He wasn't even very pleased when the kind police sergeant gave him a water pistol he found a long time before. He trundled along the road behind Tabby Cat and Mouse and grumble umbled to himself. Mouse knew stray cats are usually hungry. Mouse bought some fish for Tabby, who had brightened up a lot since he had found some friends. Mouse also bought some orange drink for Wombat. Now, let's be happy. I'm happy, said Tabby. Fish is my favourite fruit. Suddenly, Wombat felt so jealous he couldn't bear it anymore. He dipped the water pistol into his orange juice, filled it up and shot Tabby in the waistcoat. It was quite the most terrible thing he had ever done. Mouse didn't squeak to him for hours. As for Tabby, he licked and picked and picked and licked and still he felt sticky and orangey. Wombat was ashamed of himself. I'm very sorry, Tabby, he said. Would you like me to wash you with soap and water and peg you out by the ears to dry? Tabby gave a meow of terror. He darted up a tree and sat there crying. Nobody loves me. I told you, people always shoo me away and stand on my tail and shoot me with orange drink. Oh, I wish I weren't mean. The mouse tapped its pink foot in a fierce way. I'm ashamed of you, Wombat. Now, what can we do to help Tabby? Then it had an idea. What about a vacuum cleaner? What's a what's name, Mouse, eh? asked Wombat hopefully. It's a sort of machine that sucks the dust out of carpets. If we used one on Tabby Cat, we could get every scrap of orange off his fur. Let's try it on Wombat first, said Tabby. I'm a delicate thing. Wombat didn't mind. Wombat very much wanted to help. They went to a shop that sold carpets and explained to the man what they wanted to do. He was very helpful. He turned on the carpet cleaner and Tabby began to run the nozzle up and down Wombat's thick, towsly brown hair. It tickled Wombat very much. He rolled on the floor giggling. Mouse was delighted. You look so handsome, Wombat. Oh, I wish I weren't a small animal, then I could be vacuumed too. Then it was Tabby's turn. You be careful, Wombat. I don't want my ears turned inside out or my whiskers knotted. Wombat turned on the cleaner. He went up and down, up and down Tabby's back. There are lots of grey spots here and I want to get them off. You silly old muddlehead, cried Tabby. Grey spots grow on me. After all, I am a Tabby cat. 
Don't you tell me I've got a head like a muddle, growled the wombat. You've got a head like a bicycle seat. Just then, the nozzle fell off the vacuum cleaner and poor Tabby flew straight up the pipe. There was a gurgly sound in the pipe and then the cleaner went on buzzing as though nothing had happened. Wombat turned the cleaner off and he and Mouse peered down the pipe. Oh, Wombat, you are awful, said Mouse, but he couldn't help giggling. Is it nice in there, Tabby, called Wombat. I wish I could get in there and listen to the motor humming. But Tabby didn't answer. Mouse and Wombat sat down and looked at the cleaner for a while. Then they thought that perhaps they'd better unscrew it and see how Tabby was getting along. Luckily, the first thing Wombat unscrewed was the bit at the end where you take out the dust. Out came all kinds of interesting things. Little balls of cotton, scraps of straw, pins and tacks, and a great furry great wad of dust. Ooh, Tabby, whispered Mouse, that isn't you. The furry ball of dust gave a great sneeze. We found him, beamed Wombat, aren't we terribly smart? Some of the dust fell off, and there was Tabby, wearing a woolly grey overcoat of dust and a little beret of fluff on his head. Two yellow eyes glared out of the dust. Wombat was very surprised. How ever did you get so dirty, Tabby? I thought the middle of a cleaner would be as clean as clean. Tabby sneezed. I shall never forgive you, Wombat, he said. But Tabby, I didn't put you inside the cleaner. I just pointed at you and in you flew like a bird, Tab. Tabby twitched his ears and out fluttered some pieces of red and blue wool that had come out from the carpet. I'm not going to be friends with you, Wombat, not if you go down on bended paws. Wombat took off his hat and began to cry into it. Perhaps I have a head like a muddle. I am sorry, Tabby. Don't be cross, Tabby. He didn't mean to be unkind, pleaded Mouse. Tabby twitched his whiskers haughtily. The dust blew out in clouds. A cat has his pride, he said. Goodbye forever. Mouse was small, but it was smart. It knew Tabby didn't really want to go away. So it said sadly, what a pity. I thought you could have your photograph taken when we have ours done. I would like a photograph of you, Tabby dear. Wombat stopped crying. He was about to say, what photograph? But Mouse bit him on the toe just in time to stop him. Mouse had a feeling that Tabby Cat was very conceited. So it said even more sadly, well, goodbye, Tabby dear. Don't let us stop you. Well, said Tabby, I mean, I wouldn't mind having a picture of myself to send to my Uncle Tom. Wombat was delighted. You lucky, lucky puss to have an uncle. I haven't anyone. Is he a cat like you? Silly, said Tabby. He curled up his whiskers. I just might get my picture taken, Mouse, to please you. Mouse knew he had just enough money to pay a photographer. The bike with the red wheels would have to wait. The photographer was pleased to see them. He arranged Tabby looking at a flower. Just pretend it's a sardine, said Wombat, and you'll look lovely. Tabby showed all his sharp teeth in a very sweet smile. The camera clicked and it was all over. Oh, how happy Uncle Tom will be when he gets a picture of handsome me, said Tabby, as he jumped down from the chair. Now it was Mouse's turn. Mouse arranged its ears and its whiskers, draped its tail gracefully over one arm, and smiled when it was told, and was photographed. What a very intelligent small animal, said the photographer. Now it was Wombat's turn. He would not take off his old straw hat. But you must, said Tabby, otherwise you'll look just like a haystack. Wombat stuck out his lip. My hat wants to take the picture taken too. Please, Wombat, said Mouse, stroking his ankle lovingly. So Wombat took off his hat, told it he wouldn't be long, and sat before the camera. He didn't like it at all. His back legs kept slipping from the chair and his nose began to itch. Wombat, leave that nose alone, ordered Tabby. It's my nose, you old cat, Wombat, said Wombat crossly. Please try and sit still, said the photographer. Truly, really, I'm trying, said Wombat. It's for you, Mouse, he said. At last, all was ready. The photographer was hidden behind his black cloth. Wombat was grumble-umbling to himself. Mouse was waggling its ears so that Wombat could smile. No, no, there's some mud on his nose, cried Tabby, and he dashed forward to brush it off just as the camera clicked. You wicked cat, you've spoiled the picture, said the photographer. He was so upset that he wouldn't come out from under his black cloth. But Mouse sat on his shoe and argued. Mouse coaxed him to develop the picture so he could have a look at it. Yes, I shall, said the photographer, if you promise to go away and never come, ever come back. I'm not strong enough for one, but really I'm not. The picture was a great surprise. It wasn't like Tabby and it wasn't like Wombat. There was Wombat's tubby form sitting on the chair and there was Tabby's catty little face on top of it. 
Yet somehow the tabby face had short, stubby wombat ears, and somehow the stout shape of wombat had a long, grey, catty tail. I shall never live down this shame, said Tabby. But Mouse entered the photograph in a funny pictures competition, and it won. Um, uh, Tabby couldn't believe it. Wombat couldn't believe it. It won't be long before we have our bite with red wheels, said Sensible Mouse. Chapter 3. Everyone loves the circus. One morning, Wombat woke up and straight away he felt so happy he had to stand on his head. Luckily, it had a nice flat top, so he was able to balance. Waving his legs and making happy sounds, Tabby was very cross. Nobody cares whether a cat gets any sleep around here, he complained. But Wombat fell on his back and kicked his legs and sang, Something exciting, Bubble, is going to happen today. How do you know, Wombat? asked Mouse, very interested. I feel it in my bones, said Wombat. He looked under his cardigan and pointed to a rib on the left side. That bone. I don't believe your bones, said Cat Tabby scornfully. But there, just then, all three animals heard a wonderful sound. It was a band. They rushed to the side of the road. What did they see? They saw a procession of red and yellow wagons drawn by black and white spotty horses. Whee! cried Mouse, a circus. In front rode a clown with a green suit with moons and stars all over it. At the back you could see two elephants, each wearing a kind of crown of red silk fringe with gold. Oh, how exciting! Told you, said Wombat. Perhaps if we fed the horses and washed the elephants, they'd let us in to see the show for free, cried Tabby Cat. Wombat liked that idea. He put Mouse in his hat, carefully tucking in all stray ends of tail. Then he took Tabby by the paw and they hurried along and joined on the end of the circus procession. The first wagon had stopped beside a paddock, pole, paddock at the roadside and already men were busily carrying out poles, ropes and fiddly mountains of tent. Wombat trundled forward at such a rate he hauled Tabby off his feet. He sailed through the air behind Wombat, his tail streaming out like a flag, and they all arrived at the very spot where the men were putting up the tent. Please, please give us a job, gasped Tabby. That all depends, said the head man. How much wages do you want? We don't want wages, said Mouse, but we just like working for the circus. So the head man gave them all jobs. How their hearts thumped. Their paws felt cold and trembly, and Ma Mouse's gla glasses misted with excitement. A job in a circus! I'm going to be a lion tamer, said Mouse. I shall do wonderful tricks on the swings, and everyone will say, Oh, just look at that handsome puss, said, Ma um, said boasted Tabby. I just want to pat the elephants on their lovely long noses, said Wombat. But it happened differently. Mouse was put in charge of a trained beetle act. He had to perch on a table in one of the sideshows outside the big tent and take care of all the educated beetles. Mouse was insulted. Who wants to look after silly old beetles? But these are trained beetles, Mouse. They're very clever. Look, Wombat, said Tabby. They peered into the glass-topped box where six big black beetles pulled tiny golden coaches or combed their whiskers in front of looking glasses as big as, big as shillings. Oh, poo, said Mouse. But as they went away, Wombat and Tabby could hear Mouse piping, Roll up and see the brilliant black beetles, beautiful black beetles that, that have performed all the crowned heads of Europe. Roll up, roll up. If Mouse was terribly good with the beetles, the head man might allow it to tame lions later on, said Wombat. Wombat and Tabby had to sweep out the ring and make themselves useful. They wore old shabby uniforms not at all like the red and gold ones they had dreamed about, and swept their very best because, like Mouse, they hoped to get a better job later on. Wombat dreamed a bit while he was sweeping. I might get a job riding an elephant, or perhaps one of the lions will put its dear old head into my mouth and everyone will cheer. He was so busy dreaming, he did not notice he had swept himself right out of the big tent and into another. A little tent with boxes and cages all around it. Wombat poked into them all, but they were all empty. At last he came to a cage that was glassed in all round. Wombat thought he might climb inside and have a quiet sleep. 
So he had a little sleep, and when he awakened, he discovered a very strange thing. A large green snake had curled itself cozily around his middle. A yellow snake was looking out from his cardigan pocket. Oh, I expect I'm still dreaming, said Wombat. He closed his eyes and counted up to four frontwards and then backwards, which was as far as he could go. Then he opened his eyes. Father, still here. Then he noticed that another snake was curled around the crown of his dear old hat, just like a ribbon. Wombat became very angry, for his hat was his greatest treasure. Get off my hat, you big worm. He heard Taddy calling outside the cage. Taddy opened the door and peered in. Have you seen Mouse, Wombat? I can't find him anywhere. You lost my mouse? Wombat was very upset. I've got to go and look for it. Here, hold these snakes for me. Wombat tore the snakes off himself and draped them over Taddy. You look after those snakes, Tad. They aren't ours, you know, so be careful. Wombat hurried out of the cage and rushed off to look for Mouse. Tabby just stood. His tail went to sleep and there were pins and needles in every paw. He dared not flicker a whisker. Wombat did not come back, but after a while there was a merry whistle and in came the keeper. He was surprised to see Tabby. He went into the cage and unwound the snakes. Tabby didn't say thank you. He just went on standing there, his tail drooping and his ears flapping. You poor old cat, you've had a shock, said the keeper. Didn't you know that those snakes are harmless? Well, the best thing for a shock cat is a nice bit of fish. He patted Tabby on the head. Tabby fell forward, as stiff as a post, and the keeper caught him. Ah, you'll be all right after a good meal of fish, my boy, he said, and he carried Tabby back over to the icebox, which stood near the seals. On the way, he met Wombat, still running around looking for mouse and making loud, sorrowful sounds. Nope, I'm not going to look for your mouse, said the keeper. I've got this shock cat to look after. Tabby, Tabby, wake up. Oh, whatever will I do without my very own second best friend, cried Wombat. You can give him a piece of fish out of the icebox. I've other things to do. Wombat didn't like seeing Tabby as stiff as a post. He was worried about Tabby, but he was more worried about Mouse because Mouse was such a very small animal. Suppose a lion ate it. Oh, what a horrible thought. And in his worry, Wombat quite forgot that he was supposed to do what he was supposed to do and popped Tabby inside the icebox and went off, forgetting all about him. Tabby had not been inside the icebox five seconds before his whiskers wiggled and his tail began to lash hungrily. Oh, look, look, cod, snapper, salmon, and dear little squidgy sardines. What shall I eat first? Though Tabby was a well-mannered cat, he ate and ate until he could hardly move. Mm, just one more sardine and I'll go. But he had no more room for the sardine. He had to put it in his pocket and stagger out of the icebox. He tottered around the surface until he came to the little room where the bandsmen kept their instruments. There he met Wombat, who was crying into his hat. I can't find mouse anywhere, Tabby. Oh, said Tabby. Wombat looked at him. He was a pale green cat instead of a grey one. What's the matter with you, you old cat? Oh, said Tabby. Wombat frowned at Tabby. That's not a nice thing to say to, poor, to a poor wombat with a lost little mouse, Tabby. I feel as though my head is, in the, is the wrong way around, moaned poor Tabby. Well, perhaps it is, said Wombat kindly. Then he shook his head. No, because your tail and your face are still on different sides. The head man came stamping along. Where's that mouse and where are my beetles, he shouted. Tabby and Wombat couldn't imagine why the beetles had gone to, where the beetles had gone to unless they had kidnapped Mouse. I'm not a bit satisfied with any of you, shouted the head man, who felt very upset about the beetles. Just wait till I catch that mouse. Someone calling me, said a little voice, and out of a big curly, big gold musical instrument crawled Mouse, looking very spruce and carrying a brown paper parcel. Where are my beetles, yelled the head man. Safely in this parcel, explained Mouse. I really got very tired of looking after them. So I thought we'd have a little sleep, and we do feel better. Isn't that nice? 
the beetles were quite happy, though perhaps their legs were a little tangled. But the head man wasn't pleased. Look at this wombat. He didn't sweep the tent at all well. Look at that pale sick cat. Good for nothing. Oh, said Tabby. And now Mouse goes off with the mad beetles. What you three need is a hard job. I'm going to put you in the lion taming business. That will smarten you up. The head man thought Wombat and Tabby and Mouse would be scared, but they weren't. Chapter four, The Lion Tamer. Although they had just received the exciting news that they were going to work as lion tamers, Tabby still looked very pale and droopy. Mouse jumped into Tabby's pocket to comfort him. The next moment, Mouse bounced out again. Eek, there's an awful dead fish in here, Tabby. Yes, I know, said Tabby in a pale way, but I don't want it. You have it, Wombat. Wombat didn't like fish, but he didn't want to hurt Tabby's feelings, so he took the sardine and put it inside his hat. Then they went off to the lion's cage. Wombat beamed at the lion. She's a lady lion, and she is old and kind-hearted, and she never bites anyone. Do you think, said Mouse nervously, that perhaps, perhaps I'm a teeny bit small to be a lion tamer? Of course you aren't, Mouse, said Wombat, but I'll go in the cage first, just to show you what a terror bubbly kind old lady she is. Wombat undid the cage and climbed in. Tabby quickly did the lock up again. He felt he wasn't quite strong enough for lions just yet, especially after all the fish he'd eaten. I'm a very delicate pussy, you know, he muttered to himself. Wombat trundled up to the lioness. He liked her big, paddy yellow paws, and the lioness liked him. She reached out and gave him a tremendous lick, which would have taken his nose off if it hadn't been flat already. And I love you too, said Wombat. The lioness made a rumbly sound like a giant purr. She picked Wombat up by the scruff of the neck and carried him into the middle of the cage. She lay down with him before her forepaws and began to lick him like a mother cat. I had a wash yesterday, tell her, Mouse, protested Wombat, but Mouse was trembling like a leaf. Now that's enough, said Wombat. You've got to learn some tricks. That's what I'm here for. No more face washes. After all, I'm a lion tamer. Clever little cubby wubby, said the lioness, kissing Wombat on one ear and almost blowing it off. Don't call names, said Wombat. The lioness kissed the other ear. Wombat shook his head. He wished Mouse or Tabby would advise him on what a Wombat did when he was mistaken for lion's child. Then he thought, if I say I'm not her cub, she might whack me with one of those terror bubbly big paws and then I'd get dented. I'd better pretend. Mummy, he cried. Cubby, said the lioness. He trundled into her paws and nestled against her side, which smelt a bit like old bones and hay. It made Wombat sneeze, though he was really the sort of perfume he liked. Mouse darted between the bars of the cage like a pink bat and bit the lioness on the nose. You leave my wombat alone, squeaked Mouse, its glasses glittering with rage. Come and help, Tabby. And Tabby did. He was shaking with fear, for he really was a timid cat, but he unlocked the cage and went inside. I've got something for you, Mrs. Lion, said Tabby in a trembly voice. And he took Wombat's hat from his head. He had remembered that little squidgy, unwanted sardine. There it was, sitting on top of Wombat's head, a little squashed and second hand, but still fish. And Tabby knew all cats like fish. With a beautiful bow, he handed it to the lioness. Mouse scuttled like a flash up Wombat's leg and hit under his cardigan. Wombat trundled out of the cage. Fish, said the lioness, my favourite fruit. When she had finished the fish, she said to Tabby, are you my own little cubby? I'll try, said Tabby. The lioness whispered, you know, a moment ago there was a fat brown animal in here and he pretended to be my cub. But you look much more like my cubby. That's because I'm a handsome cat, said Tabby, but I'll only be your cub if you do all the tricks I'm supposed to teach you. Will you? The lioness promised. She liked Tabby much more than Wombat because he was like a little tabby lion. So Tabby became the lion tamer. He wore a splendid uniform of red with many gold buttons. The lioness did everything he told her to do, and Tabby was clapped more loudly than anyone. No one knew that the lioness was obeying him just because she loved him. Tabby became even more conceited. Wombat thought that if he were sat on once or twice and flattened out like a bookmark, it would do him the world of good. 
Hark's wombat was grumbling because he was a little bit jealous. He and Mouse had been sent to watch over Charlie, the big grey monkey. Mouse had to brush Charlie's clothes and shine his buttons and see that his vegetable mash was nice and hot. Wombat had to lead him into the ring and put him through his tricks. But of course, Charlie's tricks did not bring as much clapping as the old lioness's tricks. Also, Wombat's uniform was not as grand as Tabby's beautiful red and golden one. Wombat poked out his tongue at Charlie, and Charlie poked out his. Charlie didn't like having his keeper make faces at him, and in his clever monkey mind, he resolved to get his own back. Wombat watched the way Tabby bowed to every corner of the big tent when he had finished his act. Wombat thought maybe he could do that too. He bowed all around, and Mouse, who was inside his hut, getting a good view of everything, almost fell out of one of the holes. Chattering shrilly, Charlie jumped on Wombat's back, wound long grey hairy arms around his neck, and pulled him down into the sawdust with a thump. The people at the circus thought this was all part of the act. They laughed and clapped. Wombat tried to get up, but Charlie sat on him and poured sawdust into his ears. You stop that, you old polly wobble, growled Wombat. Mouse started out of the hut to scold Charlie and had a little pile of sawdust at once heaped on its head. Mouse started back into the hut very quickly. Let me up, you hideous old Charlie, roared Wombat. Then Charlie thought he had better do something really clever. He undid Wombat's uniform coat and took it off. He put it on himself. Then he chatted shrilly at Wombat. Mouse's agitated pink nose stuck out of the hole in the hat. Wombat, don't you do it. What a disgrace. Wombat was beaming. I think it would be fun. He only wants me to do his tricks and he'll pretend to be the trainer. Dear old monkey, isn't he clever? Mouse covered its eyes. It would not bear to look at Wombat as Wombat did all Charlie's tricks while Charlie, wearing the uniform coat, called out his orders. Wombat enjoyed being a monkey. He even tried to climb a rope but fell down on his back and was carried out to the cheers of the crowd. The head man was not pleased. I want you to be the trainer and Charlie to do the tricks. I don't want any mix-ups. Wombat is rather muddle-headed, explained Mouse. Too muddle-headed for me, said the headman. Off you go, on your way. You mean you don't want us to work in the circus anymore? Quavered poor Mouse. No, you cause too many muddles, but your friend Tabby can stay. Tabby stalked in, very grand in his uniform. Mouse ran to him and clung to his skinny grey ankle. Tabby, Tabby, we've got to go away. They don't want us here anymore. One for all, and all for one, said Tabby grandly. I shall leave too. The headman didn't care, but the lioness did. She was heartbroken to think that her tabby cub was going away. She couldn't eat. She moped in her bed of straw. She cried big lion tears. I don't know how I'll leave her, said Tabby sadly. She's such a lonely old lioness. Mouse pulled softly at his toenail. How much money have we got, Tabby? They counted it all up. They had five pounds they had won with the photograph of the wonderful Wombat. And they had another three pounds the headman had given Tabby for being a lion tamer. It was just enough for a bike with red wheels. I was thinking, said Mouse, I was thinking that if we bought Mrs. Lion a nice cuddly furry toy, it might keep her company. Of course, then we won't have enough money for our bike, said Wombat. But we can go on saving up, can't we? So they bought a big, beautiful toy. It was a baby lion with green eyes, and it was almost as big as Wombat. The lioness was delighted with it. It's really nicer than you, she told Tabby, because it won't order me around and do tricks, make me do tricks. There, I told you, said Tabby. Nobody loves me, not really. Wombat and Mouse were glad the old lioness was happy now, but Tabby was sad. I feel so ordinary, he sighed. Then let's cheer ourselves up, said Mouse. Let's go to the puppet show. Will there be free sardines, said Tabby eagerly. Mouse thought not, but it said it was sure its friends would enjoy the puppet show just the same. And they did. Chapter five, the shiny red bike. Tabby Cat liked the puppets, so did Mouse. Everyone likes to see the funny little wooden people dancing and walking and squabbling on the ends of their strings, but Wombat simply loved them. He talked about nothing else. Mouse, he said, I've got a horribly good idea. Mouse, you're not listening. Yes, I am, Wombat Dear. Then why are your ears pointing the other way, eh? To keep the wind out of them, Wombat Dear, said the mouse patiently. Wait till you hear my horribly good idea, you animals. We are waiting, Muddlehead, cried Tabby impatiently. 
Wombat stuck his lip out. For a moment, he thought he might tell them, especially Chubby. He thought himself so grand. But the idea is too good to keep to himself. Let's have our own puppet show and go around the country earning lots of money. We'd have our bike with red wheels in no time. Tabby at once wanted to know how they would buy the puppets and who would work them and why he had to have such a muddy-headed wombat for a friend when he was so handsome and wonderful a cat. Wombat just lay down and kicked his stout legs with joy. One of us can be a puppet. Hooray! I had a horribly good idea all by myself. Mouse bounced a bit with excitement. I mean, one of us could pretend and have strings tied here and there and all the time be a real live animal. Oh, Wombat, you are clever. Wombat was modest. The thought just came along and I thunk it. But who's going to be the puppet? Asked Tabby. Me. No, Wombat, your legs are much too short. And you don't have any knees. All puppets have knees. Wombat looked sadly at his legs. They did look fat and short and kneeless. More like furry brown sausages than anything else. Mouse didn't want his dear, its dear friend to be disappointed, so it chirped. But don't you see, Wombat? If Tabby is the puppet, you can work the strings. I'll make him flip, turn flips and jump backwards and fall over with a bang and everything. Wombat was delighted. Oh no, you won't, screeched Tabby. Every time Wombat comes near me, something awful happens. I won't be a puppet, I won't. I'm too delicate. Mouse stroked his paw. What a shame. It gave a sad sigh. With your graceful legs and your pretty tail and everything, I was thinking of you as a ballet cat. Really, you know, Tabby did, but never mind. A ballet cat? Tabby slipped down his fur and coiled his tail around his paws and thought of himself flitting across the stage in a shiny tunic and black tights. It was such a beautiful picture. And you could be a ballet mouse. Mouse, with a frilly skirt and a, and a star between your ears. But how could Wombat manage the strings of two puppets? I'll hold mouse with my front paws and you with my back paws, promised Wombat. No, no, don't let him mouse. Something frightful will happen to dear old me. But Mouse explained that Wombat would be only be pretending to work the strings, so nothing very bad would happen to poor Tabby. Tabby and Mouse had a very busy morning. Wombat wasn't very helpful because he was worn out from so much thinking of clever thoughts and went to sleep. He was delighted when he awakened and saw Mouse twirling around in a mouse-sized frilly pink skirt. Tabby also looked very remarkable as he flitted from place to place, putting his tail into graceful ballet positions. Doesn't he look like a teapot? said Wombat admiringly. Tabby threw himself on the ground and kicked and caterwauled until Wombat apologized and promised that he would make the puppet theater. He did this by making a big box with no front side. It had red curtains in the front, mouse made those, and black curtains at the back, mouse made that too. Wombat stood at the back of the box and pretended to pull the strings of the puppets. The show looked very lifelike. They set it up on the corner of a street in the town, and very soon a crowd of children and grown-ups had gathered around it. Wombat liked boys and girls. He stood there beaming at them, and then he pulled his face, pulled his face and popped out from under it, and beamed again and made them all laugh. Something nicked his ankle, and he looked down to see Mouse pinching away. It's nose pink with temper. Make the announcement, hissed Mouse. Oh, said Wombat. Forgot, excuse me everyone. Got to announce the show. Wombat's puppet show, I mean puppet. But Mouse is a puppet puppet. The curtains, the curtains rattled aside and there was Mouse, standing as stiffly as a little wooden mouse in the middle of the stage. Mouse had strings attached to its back and its four paws and these Wombat held in one tabby paw. Mouse stared straight ahead and did its best to look like a real puppet. Now, said Wombat in a big whisper to the boys and girls, when I pull the string, this puppet will dance. If you hear someone whistling, that will be me, and you may clap if you like. Off I go. As Wombat whistled, Mouse lifted one foot and stood on the toe. Then it stood on the other toe, everyone clapped. Some of the boys joined in with Wombat's whistle. Mouse popped up into the air and crossed its ankle in the smartest way. It twirled on the end of its long tail like a top. Then it tiptoed across the stage, whirled, si whirled around six times without coming down to earth and sank to the floor in a bow. Everyone loved Mouse. They clapped and clapped so loudly that Wombat had to say, You be quiet now, children. We've got another puppet. We've got another puppet, and his name is Tabby. It's his turn now. 
and Tabby, looking very fine in his tights and tunic, bounded onto the stage. Wombat smiled tenderly down at him. I know you want to be a success like Max, old Tab, so I'll help. Wombat jerked on the string which held Tabby's tail, and at once Tabby rose into the air, head downwards. What? Whatever are you doing, you bad Wombat? wailed Mouse behind the scenes. I'm helping dear old Tab to be a success, Mouse. You just watch. I do love helping Mouse. Tabby slowly came down to the floor again. This time he was determined not to leave it, and he hooked out his claws and stuck them into the wood of the stage, and he clung there, growling under his breath. Oh, let go, Tabby, said Wombat crossly, shaking Tabby with all his might. He tugged hard on the string tied around Tabby's middle, and Tabby's middle went up in the air like a hump. Wailing pitifully, Tabby had to let go. Wombat beamed at him. Now you're going to do a high kick, Tab. Wombat jerked on the string attached to Tabby's ankles. One paw flew up out of it, up over his head, and the other paw flew up. Tabby looked as though he was swimming. The boys and girls simply loved it. They roared with laughter as Tabby whizzed across the stage and slowly rose out of sight, tail first. The children clapped and clapped. Wombat cried, oh, they love you so much that they want you back again, lucky Tab. And he let Tabby down, crash, in the middle of the stage. Tabby was so exhausted, he hung from the strings like a cat made of straw and stuffing. So Wombat made him bow. It was just a pity that he dropped him on his nose in the middle of it. Then Tabby walked off again on his front paws with his tail sticking up like a flag. The children clapped and clapped again. Tabby was certainly a success. Oh, Tabby, giggled Mouse. I've never laughed so much in all of my mousy life. Tomorrow, said Tabby bitterly, you'll be laughing on the other side of your whiskers, Miss Mouse. Oh, the shame of it all. Now that the show was over, Wombat closed the curtains. Mouse sat on the floor of the stage, counting all the money the children and the grown-ups had thrown there. There was such a lot. The pile was much higher than Mouse and almost half as high as Tabby, who sat there glaring and meowing under his breath and untying the strings from his legs and tail. I'm leaving you animals. I've had enough. I won't put up with it any more. But you're our friend, said Wombat. Oh, come on, Tabby. Isn't it fun? Freely, ruly? But Tabby wouldn't speak to them. And in the morning they found that he had gone. And so had all the money that they had saved for the bike with red wheels. Mouse and Wombat didn't mind about the money, but they were very unhappy about Tabby. Perhaps I shouldn't have pulled him up into the air by his tail, Mouse. Cats like to be dignified. Oh, boy, 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 said little Mouse, crying into a handkerchief the size of a five-penny stamp. I love our old Tab, gulped Wombat. I didn't at first, but now I do. I love his funny face and his skinny old tail, and the way he thinks he's so handsome. Things won't be the same without a cat around, sobbed Mouse. Just then, there was a tremendous ting-a-ling outside the hedge where Mouse and Wombat had made their bed for the night. That sounds like a bike! They hurried around to the road. There was the shiniest, newest bike in the world. Never had wheels been so red. Red as roses, red as radishes. There was a carrier on the back and a tool kit and a pump and a beautiful bell. And riding this wonderful bike was Tabby Cat, who rang the bell again. Hurry up, you animals. Don't you want to ride off and have adventures? Tabby, you didn't run away, said Wombat. You just went off to buy this lovely bike, said Little Mouse. Tabby looked conceited. Well, I was going to run away. And then I thought, how would Wombat and Mouse get along without their second best friend? It's not everyone who has a friend like wonderful men. Wombat and Mouse said that was so. Tabby got into the carrier, Wombat sat on the seat and did the pedalling. Mouse sat on the handlebars and ring a ding the bell and they carried off down the road to look for more adventures. The Muddle-Headed Wombat at School, Part 2, Chapter 1. A Cat Needs Clever Friends. 
Mouse and Tabby Cat and Wombat lived in a little house at the edge of Big Bush. Big Bush was green and quiet and airy, the right place for animals to live. Mouse was a kind, pretty mouse. He looked after the cooking and mouse work and tried to bring Wombat up the right way. Tabby was a skinny grey cat who believed he was very handsome and brainy. As for Wombat, he was just happy and muddled headed. Sometimes, Tabby became discontented. You know, Mouse, he said, a brilliant cat like me should have smart friends, people, people who can count to more than four. I can count to more than four, answered Mouse, very offended, and I can do hard sums, and I know geography, and history, and I can knit, and yes, Mouse, sighed Tabby, but you're so small, you hardly notice. Mouse was very upset about Tabby's remark because, after all, it couldn't help being small and it made the best of things. So feeling a small fairy sob, it dived into a lily and pulled the petals in after itself. But it came out very quickly indeed, with a bee after it. You see, Mouse explained Tabby, even a bee is as big as a dragon to you. Anyway, I wasn't talking about you. I was talking about Wombat. It's not Wombat's fault he can only count up to four, said Mouse, feeling very grey and miserable by now. He runs out of paws, that's the trouble. Just the same, said Tabby, your handsome pussy needs clever friends. He needs conversations. By this time, Mouse needed its warm, brown, comfortable Wombat friend very much indeed. But where was Wombat? Down on the rubbish tip. That's where that animal is, said Tabby, and he was right. The rubbish tip was a little gully near Big Bush where people, humans and animals often put unwanted things. Wombat loved to poke around there and find useful old saucepan lids for banging and worn out murder tires for bowling. But this afternoon, he had found something really exciting. He lay on the ground and kicked his stout legs with joy. He made such loud, wombatty noises that Tabby and Mouse came running at once. Oh, Wombat, did you see a snake, gasped little Mouse. Did you get a prickle in your paw? Say you have, begged Tabby. He loved playing doctors. I'm just happy, said Wombat. Look what I've found. Tabby and Mouse looked. Tabby shuddered. He was such a fine, delicate cat. Wombat had found an old, old teddy bear, bald all over, with no nose, only one leg, and mean little glassy eyes. Mouse was cross. Throw away that dirty old thing at once, you Wombat, you. Wombat stroked the teddy's bare, cottony old head. Don't you take any notice of Mouse Tedder. It's such an excited bubble little animal. Why do you call him Tedder? asked Tabby. Because he's a teddy bear, of course, said Wombat. Even a Wombat can see that. No matter how much Mouse pointed out that Tedder was grubby and raggy and old, Wombat wouldn't listen. No matter how hoarsely Tabby switched his tail, Wombat paid no attention. He chatted to Tedder all the way home. If Mouse says anything horrible to you, such as having a good wash in soap and water, we'll put Mouse right in the sugar basin with the lid on. Well, let me solve his poor old leg, pleaded Mouse, who thought that once it got Tedder away from Wombat, it could easily give him a quick bath. But Wombat was stern. Tedder doesn't like needles stuck in him, do you, Tedder? He gave Tedder a loving poke in the stomach, expecting that he would squeak like all teddy bears. But Tedder didn't say a word. His squeaker had been broken years before. A tear rolled down Wombat's leathery nose. I do believe my Tedder's being hurt, truly, truly. Leave it to your clever Tabby, said Tabby importantly. I can buy a new squeaker at the toy shop and we shall have a lovely, exciting operation. I shall be Dr. Tabby. You might hurt my friend Tedder, you old cat, growled Wombat, and he stuffed the bear down the front of his cardigan, glared at Tabby and trundled off. Mouse felt just a little jealous. After all, it had always been Wombat's best friend. Perhaps you are right, Tabby dear, it said thoughtfully. Perhaps Wombat should go to school and learn things, and then we could all have conversations. Besides, thought Mouse, school would get Wombat away from that horrid old Tedder. Wombat was thrilled when Tabby and Mouse told him about school. They made it sound very exciting. You'll learn all kinds of interesting things, Wombat, said Tabby, who had been to school before when he was younger such as drawing on the blackboard and singing and exercises and sums. And the teacher will tell you lovely stories, added Mouse. Wombat drummed his back paws on the floor excitedly. Will she tell me my truly, really favourite, Cinder Gorilla and the Lizard of Oz? 
Oh yes, promised Mouse. And besides, think of all the people you'll have to play with. Wallabies and bandicoots and two lizards and even boy and girl jellies. Wombat loved boy and girl jellies. He made up his mind right away. I'll start tomorrow, he roared, and Ted will go too. Tabby was shocked. Oh no, he's much too grabby for school. Ugh, teacher wouldn't think he's respectable, said Mouse. He is so respected, Bubble, growled Wombat, and he pulled his hat over his eyes and wouldn't come out, but stayed there muttering things like, I won't go to school if Ted can't go too. Tabby twitched a meaning whisker at Mouse. We shall have to have a tiny talk, I'm afraid, Mouse. So Tabby and Mouse had a little talk. They agreed that if Wombat said Teddy could have a good bath, they would allow him to go to school with Wombat. And to make things easier, said Tabby, I shall go along too, as a friend of the family, and explain that Wombat is not only just a little muddle-headed, but that he is very attached to this dreadful teddy bear. Oh, Tabby, you are wonderful, said Grateful Mouse. I know, said Tabby. It took a long time for Mouse to persuade Wombat to allow his tether to be washed. Don't be mean, Wombat, said Clever Mouse. After all, wouldn't Tedder enjoy school too? Perhaps he'd like to hear Cinderella. All right, said Wombat cheerfully. And what do you think, Mouse? I took the squeaker out of my old sick dog, dog and Tedder ate it for me, and now he squeaks. Oh my, said Mouse. The sick dog was a squashy woolen dog that Wombat liked to take to bed when he was feeling miserable. However, it hadn't a squeaker. It had... A barker. True enough, Tedder now barked. Up, up! Mouse felt this wasn't right at all. Well, it said in a hopeless kind of way, I'll wash Tedder and perhaps he'll look better. All the time Tedder was being washed, Wombat thumped around giving directions. Don't get soap in his dear little beady eyes. Watch out for his poor ear. It's terribly loose. I'm here, Tedder. Don't be frightened. You just tell me if Mouse gets you and I'll sit on it. Tedda came out of the basin looking very soggy and flat, but Mouse said that as soon as he was dry, he would be as fluffy as a bald teddy bear could be. Mouse pegged him on the line and Wombat sat on the grass and told him what great fun they would have at school. We're going to learn things like four and eight make eleventy-one and C-O-W spells cat and things like that. And perhaps you'll be allowed to play in the sand pit, said Tabby. Yes, we will play in the sand pit, Tedder, said Wombat. What's a sand pit? Eh, Tabby, eh? So Tabby explained. Wombat thought this was very splendid, for wombats are digging animals and he loves to dig. I'll dig a tunnel, 11 miles long, and you and the other children can play in it, Tedder, he said. Mouse was rather sad. Though it busied itself washing Wombat's cardigan and doing other little jobs, its glasses misted over every now and then. How I shall miss you, Wombat, even though you'll become very clever. I will miss you. I'll pretend to be muddle-headed while I'm with you, Mouse, promised Wombat. At last, Tedder was dry, although he had no nose and only one leg. He was now a pretty golden colour and Mouse knew he would have no germs on him. Wombat was delighted. Teacher will love Tedder best of all, he said. The next morning, Tabby and Wombat got ready. Mouse saw that Wombat washed his ears and Tabby cut his toenails, which tired him very much. He said it was like trying to trim a hedge and he was too delicate, really. Then Mouse and Tabby gave Wombat's thick brown coat a good brushing with a little straw whisk broom and Mouse tidied up his clean cardigan and he was ready. As it was the beginning of term, lots of people were enrolling. Some of the younger bandicoots were already missing their mothers and crying very hard. Tabby thought it might be a good idea for Wombat to show that them his tether and take their minds off their troubles. I'll enroll you, Wombat, he said helpfully. Besides, I know teacher will be delighted to see me. Tabby was looking very spruce in a new red waistcoat and a bow tie. He had practiced a lot of big words to show that the teacher that even though he had a muddle-headed wombat for a friend, he was truly a very well-educated cat. The teacher was a lady kangaroo called Miss Roo. Tabby took charge of things at once. Of course, he explained, wombats are different. I don't know what they have in their heads. Dust, I suppose, and old fish bones. 
the peach stones, things like that. I don't suppose my wombat will ever get out of first class, poor fellow, but we must try to teach him something. Miss Rue understood. She also understood about Tedder. But Tedder is only allowed to come for a week or two, she said. The other pupils might think Wombat a baby, and he wouldn't like that. Now put your name right here, Tabby. Tabby wrote his name in his best poor writing. Even though it was a very ordinary name, it looked very fine. Tabby felt wonderfully important. Splendid, said Miss Rue. Now you're enrolled. I've put you into third class, as you are so clever. But I don't want to go to school, gurgled Tabby. I just wanted to enroll Wombat. You don't want to go to school? A clever cat like you, cried Miss Rue. She seemed so surprised and disappointed that Tabby didn't know what to say. He didn't want to offend Miss Rue, but on the other hand, he didn't want to go back to school either. You could be so helpful, you see, Tabby, said Miss Rue. You could be blackboard cat in charge of the chalk. I do need a reliable person to do that, you know. At once, Tabby saw himself handing out beautiful sticks of blue and yellow chalk and smacking on the paw any cheeky wallaby called Bandicoot who grabbed. It was a lovely picture. Well, he said, in that case, I mean, just to be helpful. I was brought up to be a helpful pussy, you know. Perhaps just for a little while. But now I'd better go and fetch Wombat. That Wombat? wasn't anywhere in the playground. A saucy young bandicoot had been rude to Tedda, and Wombat had marched right home. Poor Mouse was sitting on the edge of the teapot explaining to Wombat all the reasons why he just had to go to school now that Tabby had taken all the trouble to enrol him. Won't, said Wombat. He lay on the ground and waved his legs in the air. He felt happy and carefree with no more worries. Won't, and Tedder won't either. I don't care about Tedder, cried Mouse. I don't care if he has nothing but sawdust in his head forever and ever, but you're my wombat. Just then, Tabby rushed home, fur on end, whiskers twitching. I'm enrolled, and wombat isn't, he cried. It's not fair, Mouse, you know. I'm not the muddlehead in this family. Oh, how did it happen? Everything happens to me. The end. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for the Australian Reading Hour, and I hope you find some time to turn some pages yourself today.